We are warriors, the chosen few, who were summoned to this land to secure victory from the goddess of harmony, Cosmos. There will come a future in which that victory shall be won. And so I ask you, to lead in that future. Welcome back to Final Fantasy for Psychology and Philosophy. This episode is about the character types in Final Fantasy. There have always been roles assigned to the characters in the Final Fantasy series. Since the very first installment was released, the Warriors of Light were given individual tasks relevant to the very central gameplay. Beginning with the original six classes, each of which having a very specific purpose, the casting of the characters was always at the core of the roleplay. Although not every game in the series had what one would refer to as a class system, Final Fantasy is well known for its numerous incarnations of the same basic jobs from 1 right through to 14 and beyond. These once black and white classes, no pun intended, have been attributed to characters either by default or through the choices of the players, and gradually became associated with personalities. But the roles of the protagonists in Final Fantasy can be defined by many contributing factors. As the design of the heroes became more sophisticated along with the technology that renders and projects them, the individual personalities and archetypes of the characters became much clearer. Patterns began to develop. Sometimes these patterns were in the behavior and body language of the characters. Other times they were in the stories and the numerous personalities attached to them. The interactions between the heroes also began to develop patterns. Generally, this was not very noticeable until the event of Final Fantasy VI, featuring colorful, quirky personalities such as Edgar and Kefka. The dynamic between the characters in FF6 was not only interesting, but it was also unique and refreshing for its time, if we consider some of the rather underdeveloped and static characters in its five predecessors. Now in the 21st century, we have characters as well-developed as the steadfast objective lightning from 13. It's clear to see that there is character development in the series, the changes that the protagonists undergo seem to be connected to the cloth the Light Warriors are cut from, whether they're symbolic, literal, or figurative changes. An example of a symbolic change would be when Princess Garnet from FF9 changes her name to Dagger when she wants to become strong and independent, and then later cutting her hair to represent her acceptance of her past as a helpless victim, as well as embracing her future as a powerful queen. Although Dagger is a fairly well-rounded character, the narrative of Final Fantasy IX effectively used symbolism to lend to the storytelling rather than adding an extra script to elaborate on the specifics of her psychological metamorphosis. It's clear from the cutscene that Sedane passively observes the haircut that he is pleased, and he immediately adapts to this change, knowing without the need for much dialogue that she has grown up and become strong. This can be seen visually, if you examine the two portraits of Garnet before and after she regains her voice on the third disc. The previous avatar with long hair depicts her as a sad young maiden, appearing to be lost in memories and thoughts. She is looking down into the side, whatever she may look like to you or I, she is not displaying the body language of a happy, confident woman. However, on disc 4 after she has cut her hair, Dagger's portrait is looking straight at the player. She is smiling and she looks much more mature, confident, and relaxed. This would be a symbolic development, for apart from attributed symbolism, a static picture is not evidence of a character development. This avatar switch can also be seen in Final Fantasy VII, during the scene in Nibelheim during Cloud's past. His portrait is different because he was younger. However, one might say that Cloud was also a different person in his past in more ways than one, as those of us who have played the game will likely realize. A literal development in character refers to a change in personality that is evident without the use of symbols or metaphors. An example of this would be the scene in Final Fantasy XIII, when Lightning tells Hope that she made a mistake when she urged him to fight objectively without analyzing the cause he was fighting for. Final Fantasy XIII is filled with dynamic character development between virtually every combination of protagonists, but the literal personality changes go back as far as Final Fantasy IV. When Rydia musters the courage to cast fire, despite her fear of fire, and enables the party to pass over Mount Hobbs, she is undergoing a literal transition. The literal character development in the older games is generally more simplistic, but it is nonetheless present. Figurative character development is present in every Final Fantasy. Likely the easiest example to name would be the changing of jobs and equipment. 
If we keep in mind that we are playing a series of role-playing games, it is not a stretch to say that equipping a Genji glove or a pair of jump boots in FF6 would slightly modify the way a player would interact with the character. If Shadow is wearing a Genji glove, then his ability to dish out multiple hits in one turn would affect the roles we are casting him in to varying degrees. Indeed, the abilities we can and can't equip or use on a character in battle can actually alter our willingness to include him in the party at any given moment. A specific example of figurative changes in the Final Fantasy heroes would be the upgraded classes in the first game of the series. Although the characters never interacted with one another in any tangible way, the promotion was as radical as it was rewarding. Your heroes of light could wield superior weapons, use better magic, and their sprites looked different to boot. Sure, the characters couldn't speak, and it was unclear what they thought of the quest they were drafted into, but the changes in sprites and equipment were noticeable developments to the party as a whole. After all, there was suddenly a ninja on most of our teams. The many class systems vary in their complexity and customizability, and for this reason, there are numerous paths of figurative development that our 10 plus generations of heroes can walk. This being said, the importance and relevance of character roles has been present in Final Fantasy since the very beginning. The reason I have taken the time to find similarities between the different characters in the series is because I have always found the subject fascinating. Not only has it enriched my experience as a gamer to view the main series' worlds as a complex, interconnected universe, but it has also deepened my appreciation and understanding of the characters as a whole, and served to intensify my immersion. I have been able to play Final Fantasy as a series rather than separate games with unrelated characters. Although some similarities between the games are obvious, the series is chock full of cross-references, remixes, and parallels that rival some of the greatest works of fantasy fiction in their complexity. These things have created lore in the series. I believe that the character archetypes are an important part of this lore. From close examination of the archetypes sprawled out over decades of Final Fantasy, I have come to the conclusion that there are ten major archetypes among the colorful protagonists. There are many ways to categorize the characters in the games, and the simplest of these would be to arrange them by their class, although many of the diverse class combinations overlap. But after years of thought, I have decided to group them by the following values. 1. Their core personality traits. 2. Their ambition, story, and need. 3. Their role in the party and relation to the quest. The reason I have chosen these variables to categorize the archetypes is because there are simply too many overlapping factors, such as age, class, job, race, and social status. Amarant from FF9, for example, has monk-type abilities and weapons, but his personality and attitude toward the other characters is very dissimilar from other monk-type characters, like Sabin from FF6 or Yang from FF4. I have also included the recently created Light Warriors from the DS remake of FF3, for they possess many of the same qualities that the newer characters exhibit. But I am choosing to exclude Final Fantasy XI and XIV, and all of the sequels and non-main series games despite my personal love for them. This is because there are simply too many characters in these other games, many of which follow more unique patterns, and some of which are devoid of personality altogether. Additionally, there are some very noteworthy playable characters whom I did not assign to one of these archetypes, as well as some non-playable characters who also fit into the basic ten archetypes. All the characters who have been left out were either non-playable, too complex, too unique, or too underdeveloped to place. Thus, the characters I will be examining in more detail will be the main characters from the DS Remake of 3, FF4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, and 13. The character archetypes are as follows. The Treasure Hunter, the Valiant Protector, the Supportive Youth, the Maverick, the Noble Rose, the Dependable Companion, the Magical Princess, the Mysterious Stoic, the Lost Youth, and the Wise Old Fool. Every Final Fantasy from 2 and up contains some combination of these roles. There are four roles that seem to appear only in female characters, and the rest seem to appear only in male characters. However, many of the characters, particularly from 6, 8, and 12, appear to belong to more than one archetype. I found that the hardest characters to place were Edge, Cloud, Ark, Squall, and Kryl. In the case of Kryl, it was simply because her personality was grossly underdeveloped. However, in the case of others, it was because of overlapping personality traits. Additionally, there are some noteworthy characters whom I have left out of this thesis. Characters who changed dramatically in personality were evaluated based on how they acted in the majority of the story scenes. The Treasure Hunter 
He is a playful, brave, reckless vagabond who travels through the world without a single care. He is sometimes quite flirtatious, and he can be rather immature, but he is very charming and charismatic. Hold on to this for me, would you? Just until I bring Varnak. On your feet, you Aria! All right, all right. Pidgey, aren't we? This archetype possesses a great wit and a sense of humor rather than a deep intelligence. Although he seems to be rather proud at times, he is very adaptable when he needs to be. He is also very cunning. Usually he's hiding a rather dark past or a great hurt, but he doesn't typically allow it to ruin his fun. Usually this character is of lower class, or quite literally a thief or pirate. In one instance, he's actually a prince who acts like a commoner. However, he always has a fancy, gentlemanly quality, and some kind of acute talent. If you examine his clothing, it will likely not take long for you to notice that the treasure hunter has a streak of vanity. Even though he is virtually always on the road, traveling from tavern to tavern and plotting anything from petty theft to treason with his allies, his hair is extra tidy, or his shirt is extra fancy, or he is simply showing off non-stop from the moment you meet him. Hmm. I dare say I've soiled my cuffs. If a dungeon's waiting for us at the end of the night, it had best have a change of wardrobe. You may recognize him as Luneth, Edge, Bartz, Locke, Setzer, Irvine, Sedane, or Balthier, three of which kidnap a lady with an airship, and four of which are literally thieves, I'm sorry, treasure hunters. If we recall, Sedane, Edge, and Irvine are incapable of resisting a beautiful woman, and Setzer, Bartz, Balthier, Locke, and Luneth all flirt with a lady at least once within the games they're in. The treasure hunter, despite his occasional and in some cases frequent bravado, is at his core a noble and trustworthy ally who can back up his claims with his enviable battle skill and unbreakable will. Although he seems impractical at times, for he is often focused on shiny things Gale and girls, he is an invaluable party member. He's usually the one to figure out how to open up a door, or the one who thinks of stealing the clothes from a castle guard, and without him the party could not progress and consequently save the world. Although all the treasure hunters possess varying degrees of silliness, and their virtues are questionable at times, all of these happy-go-lucky pretty boys have charm, wit, and a lust for life. I play the leading man. Who else? The Valiant Protector. This protective, usually older man varies slightly in personality, but his principle is always the same. He will defend you to the death without hesitation. He is innately frustrated, and he can often be extremely stubborn, but he is always exceedingly strong, very loyal, responsible, and completely devoted to his cause. He lives to save the world from evil and to protect his kingdom, his love, his family, or his friends at all costs. He is usually chivalrous and humble, although he is often easily tricked, he always finds the truth in the end. The valiant protectors of Final Fantasy are Ingus, Cecil, Cyan, Barrett, Steiner, Kimari, Bosch, and Snow. They are all protecting something. Sarah, Sasune, Rosa, Rydia, Doma, Elaine, Owen, Marlene, The Planet, Posse, Alexandria, Garnet, Yuna, Ash, Larsa, or Sarah, Hello, the Sea. Most of these characters play a protective role in more ways than this, too. As a knight, sentinel, or paladin, some of these characters can literally take hits for their allies in battle. Other times, they will take hits for their friends in the stories or cutscenes. Barrett, for example, stands in front of his friends and takes a barrage of bullets. You should rely on your allies more. Although there are many other characters and indeed other Final Fantasy archetypes that will protect with their lives and are willing to help under all circumstances, the sentiment simply isn't the same. Sabin from FF6, for example, might have been cast in this role, but his need for freedom and independence set him apart. Another choice could have been Squall from FF8. However, he spends the majority of the game playing the role of the Magnet, and that is typically how he is remembered. Such a faithful hound to cling so to a fallen kingdom. Better than throwing it away. If we examine the general attitudes underlying the behavior of these characters, it may become apparent that the focus of a Valiant Protector is first and foremost to protect a specific thing. This archetype is usually one of the most practical-minded of the party members. He has a strong sense of responsibility for himself and others, and he is often willing to sacrifice his own ego in order to maintain the livelihood of his comrades. 
Usually this man is headstrong and perhaps even boorish at times. He sometimes refuses to listen to reason, or he simply fails to see the obvious lesson right before his eyes. However, this hero will usually admit to being wrong once he discovers what it is that he was wrong about. It was my fault. I put her in danger. I know that. Let me make things right. The people may hate me, but that does not free me of my charge. I have no right to be called by that name. Then live and reclaim it. Although he isn't innately self-aware, and he often masks his true feelings behind his stack of self-imposed duties, he will invariably discover the true meaning of his role as a protector and become an unstoppable vehicle for justice and gallantry. Better be safe, huh? The support of youth. Although she is rarely the main female character, she has a knack for instantly becoming the center of attention regardless of the situation she's in. This is the Refia, Child Rydia, Cryl Realm, Yuffie, Selfie, Eiko, Riku, Pinello, and Vanille archetype. Traditionally, this character was always a very innocent child, but over the years it became more common for her to appear as an adolescent, and in one instance she is as old as 19. Because of the extremely naive nature of this character, she usually comes across as eccentric and sometimes a little bit or extremely ditzy. Feast your eyes on Nice. All naturey. She tends to be childlike in every sense of the word. Cheerful, impulsive, inquisitive, trusting to a fault, and sometimes downright mischievous. Although the support of youth is a rather high maintenance character, both emotionally and physically, due to her childlike mind and frail constitution. He didn't have to be so mean, yeah? I almost cried. Yeah, Riku. Just kidding. Her neediness and naivety is often juxtaposed with an unrivaled maternal instinct and an uncanny insight. She is usually able to cheer up the other team members when they are in the depths of despair, or in the depths of a dungeon. She does this simply by remaining extraordinarily optimistic and strong when faced with often horribly difficult trials, inadvertently inspiring the party to do the same, or simply by attempting to comfort and reason with the others when they are in mid-crisis. Although she isn't particularly mature, and appears rather underdeveloped in multiple ways, so she provides a very strong sense of hope and reassurance on, throughout the stories in Final huh? Fantasy. Oh, this character worry. almost always comes from a broken or lost world or town that has been ostracized, destroyed, or conquered. However, she remains plucky and sweet, and usually her tragedy only reinforces her drive to improve the world. In some instances, she is a symbol of what the party members are really fighting for, because she is a reminder of not only the innocent people who cannot protect themselves, but also of the ramifications of the wrath and cruelty that the villains exercise. Oftentimes, the support of youth possesses a potentially terrifying power, which is the reason for her family or tribe's persecution. This is evident in Final Fantasy IV, VI, and IX with Rydia, Realm, and Eiko, who all come from a magical village with inconveniently acute powers. In the case of Riku's Albed tribe from FF10, the use of Machina is a larger threat to the oppressors in the magic-based Spira, as opposed to the analog worlds in some of the older games where magic is still a novelty. Perhaps one of the most horrifying examples of this often retold story is the destruction of the Summoner Village in Final Fantasy IX, and the devastating use of the stolen Eidolons that followed. Eiko, an innocent child who is only six years old, lives alone and hungry in the destroyed Medan Sari with the Moogles, and is for the most part unaffected by her rather bleak lot in life. It's not that the support of youth archetype is oblivious to the evils of the world or the crimes that have befallen her and her family. It's simply that she is sheltered by her innocence from the true horror. Her young, fresh mind allows her to see past the hatred and vengeance that the adults often fall victim to. She can see that the violence and destruction is innately the problem, and she fully believes in their ability to end it. The Maverick this is the character that has the most trouble communicating with the other party members. Sometimes he simply cannot relate to them, and sometimes his emotions, his situation, or his agenda simply clash too much with those of the others for him to desire it in the first place. He is a loner, he is innately self-serving, 
and he is non-committal and indifferent most of the time. He usually has few friends and he doesn't care to get close enough to anyone to get to know them. The Maverick is usually prone to anger and sometimes even fits of rage, but it is a very cold, contained anger. He usually has a mysterious, foggy, or forgotten past, and the player often has to go out of their way to learn all of it. Outwardly, he appears to care very little for the people and events around him, but what he is feeling on the inside is usually surprisingly different from what he appears to be thinking. The characters who fit into this archetype are Kane, Shadow, Vincent, Squall, Amaranth, and Oron. What these characters have in common is that they directly or indirectly go against the grain more than the other party members. Even though some of them, Oron in particular, have a cause or a person that they outwardly devote themselves to, their real objective is often a little bit more sinister than it may appear. Oron may seem to be more devoted to the quest than to his own self-interest, unlike the other mavericks of the series. He is... One of the most complex characters in Final Fantasy, and admittedly this is part of the reason he is placed in the Maverick category. He's only a hairbreadth away from being cast as a Valiant Protector because he seems to value the lives of others more highly than he does his own. But the thing that makes him different from the Valiant Protector is that fighting against fate is his main focus, and it is never truly the focus of the Valiant Protectors. Sure, all of the protective knights and paladins and sentinels want to fight fate at least somewhat. Technically all of the heroes in Final Fantasy he want to change the world, but none of them go against the grain the way the Maverick does. Oron aids and protects not because it is his cause in life, but because it is necessary in order for him to advance to the moment where he can free himself from his fate, his memories, and his regrets. Oron has extreme contempt for Yevin, the dominant religion in Spira, and is able to see its corruption much more quickly than many of the Valiant Protectors, often blinded by their faith in a person or faction, would likely have done. Simply put, the quest in FF10 is very personal to Oron, and even though he chooses to help some of the other characters along the way, he is ultimately doing it for himself. The Maverick is hiding a very dark, hateful secret, and he is harboring deep feelings of inferiority, guilt, regret, anger, fear, and self-loathing. Huh. And when he takes over your mind again, what then? If that should happen... Kill me without a second thought. Oftentimes, he will use his focus to mask these deep feelings and sometimes outwardly blame his objective or another person in attempt to hide these feelings from his associates and, more importantly, himself. Other times, he will simply walk away and abandon the party with no warning in order to remove himself from these feelings. His cause or focus is rarely the true source of his attitude, but a mere excuse. For example, Kane's attack on Cecil was not caused by Golbez, but by the rage induced by his envy and his obsession with Rosa. This archetype tends to have trust issues that prevent him from fully committing himself to his quest, and he can appear rather irrational and even irresponsible at times, despite having what appears to be a practical and nihilist nature. It usually takes the Maverick about 40 hours of gameplay to open up to a single person, or to admit to himself that he has emotional baggage and that he desires friends. Even after all the struggling of the other characters to get the Maverick to understand that he is loved and needed, he will never completely shed his cold demeanor or completely alter his fatalistic outlook, although there is almost always evidence that he has changed. Amaranth, for example, admits that his attitude was the reason for his losing to Zidane, and he also attempts to socialize more with the other characters, even though he is still an antisocial pessimist. Possibly the best example of a Maverick who finds inner peace is Squall. Over the course of Final Fantasy VIII, Squall learns several life lessons and has some rather interesting brushes with death. He grows into a rather valiant hero and shares mutual respect with his allies. However, Squall's initial reluctance to grow emotionally is a classic mark of a maverick in Final Fantasy. This archetype seems to be the most unfriendly in Final Fantasy and perhaps even the hardest to like, but the reality is that the maverick is simply a hurt or damaged person who is unable to crawl out of his cocoon without the support and patience of a loving ally.